The term hacker has historically been a divisive one. Sometimes it's used to label individuals who use their skills and creativity to solve technical problems. But oftentimes, when we hear the word hacker, there's a version that we're all familiar with. System breach. Oh. Firewall one. We got a problem. All I have to do is hack the registrar and change the name server configs. We have a zero bug attacking all login and overlay files. Run antivirus. Give me a systems display. We'll isolate the node and dump them on the other side of the router. I'm trying. It's moving too fast. Better luck next time, slugheads. I am invincible! While Hollywood tends to exaggerate the hacker stereotype for entertainment value, there's still some validity to it. It's not always a hooded figure in a dark room, but some hackers have a more nefarious side when they use their technical skills for the wrong reasons. Ultimately, I think the adversary, when we're using the word hacker to mean the ill-intended person doing illegal activity, uh, something's driving them to do things that the other normal individual might not. As technology advanced through the 20th century, it opened up a world of possibilities and transformed the way we live and work. However, it also opened up a new realm of crime, cybercrime. So as we started to build out the whole computer revolution or whatever that might be, you know, the advent of the internet, uh, the personal computer coming into your homes, uh, we're building software, you know, the whole world, all the geeks and nerds were writing code to be able to do Pretty cool stuff. Communicate through email, have instant messenger, send files back and forth. But maybe we weren't totally cognizant of all the implications of security when we make a mistake in any of those programs that we create. Hackers are textbook opportunists. They began to exploit software vulnerabilities in ways we weren't prepared for and they soon realized that stealing and selling sensitive data could make a pretty penny. If it were measured as a country, cybercrime would be the third largest economy in the world. It's a booming industry that's become incentivized and commercialized. And with so many tools and resources available today, it's easier than ever to get in on it. As these tools become more broadly available, it requires less skill sets to operate the tools, to get access to the tools. It's pretty much plug and play. And so the threshold to get into this industry, uh, the bar has been, been lowered to a degree where it's uh, open to anybody. The availability of this information has never been higher. I can go to YouTube right now, I can go to Google right now, and with a couple of Google searches and 10 minutes of YouTube videos, I can teach myself how to use things like the Metasploit framework in, in no time at all. Being a threat actor doesn't require you to have any technical experience, where a normal individual could actually just access tools on the dark web and deploy that to anyone. Anybody with a network connection and ill intentions or having been led to a life of crime can pick this up and run with it. Hacking has become more mainstream and extremely accessible, which draws in a wide range of people, each with their own agenda. The motivations here run the continuum. You have people who are doing this for curiosity. They might be looking to research these vulnerabilities and exploit them because it's just interesting. A hacker group or individual hacker are mostly motivated by financial gain. Their governments are paying them to do it. It could be their job. They have nothing better to do. They want to post something on a forum and say, hey, look what I did. They might want to cause some sort of chaos or outage. Then you have people doing this because they kind of have no other choice. Well, we have some idea of why attackers do what they do. We still need to understand who are they? Who are we really defending against? Who is the modern hacker? The modern hacker has a certain amount of malice. I think they have a certain amount of greed for money. I think they have a certain amount of craving for fame or power or something that might drive them to do what they do. The modern hacker is really a, a spectrum of who it could be. Uh, it could be somebody that's what, what a lot of people would call a script kitty. And then you kind of keep going up the spectrum of cyber criminals all the way up to nation state where they're very advanced in what they do and, and they're very selective and they're targeted. Not all threat actors are created equal. 
Each one is unique, with their own set of skills and motivations. But typically, you can sort today's attackers into three different groups. Advanced persistent threats, cyber crime groups, and script kitties. In the top tier, we have advanced persistent threats, also known as APTs, or nation states. As the name suggests, these threats are advanced. APTs are usually organized and well-funded. They tend to take a low and slow approach and are very skilled at operating under the radar. Instead of casting a wide net, they go after high-value targets that are carefully chosen and researched. Nation states are typically more around espionage and intellectual property theft, uh, helping to develop their own economy, stealing trade secrets, stealing counterintelligence secrets. A politically motivated attacker, totally different situation, right? They're not necessarily financially motivated. You're going to have to think about what are the things that are important to that political motivation and what is sensitive in my environment that could be disrupted for their end. They're a government organization, they're a military, they're an entity that follows some sort of organized standard. More advanced actors are gonna be stealthy. You know, you hear advanced persistent threat as APT, legitimately meaning, hey, they're pretty sophisticated and they're not messing around, just throwing stuff against the wall to see what sticks. In the middle tier, we have organized cyber criminals and cybercrime groups. These adversaries act in packs to reap all illicit profits that cybercrime has to offer. Cybercrime groups can be large or small, can be loosely affiliated or well-defined, and can vary in sophistication. These groups are usually made up of experienced individuals, each with a particular set of skills or specialization. As far as their targets, they typically aim for cash-rich or data-rich businesses, or whoever can make them a quick buck. Cybercrime is typically based around financial gain, either through ransomware, extortion, credit card fraud, any number of ways to steal money from electronic banking systems. You have malware authors and developers that can write the code themselves, and they'll do custom evasion and obfuscation that'll slip past antivirus or prevention measures. Most of these crime groups have very well-defined processes. They have training books, they have full standard operating procedures on how to facilitate your intrusion, what to do once you're in the network, what tools to use, what commands to run. You see in like ransomware gangs, even Conti as an example, they have a playbook, they have a checklist, they have step-by-step -step instructions so that a trained monkey can still make the money. In the lower tier, there are script kitties. Those who have limited knowledge of hacking and instead use open source tools or pre-made scripts to their advantage. What script kitties may lack in skill, they make up for in grit. They will experiment with anything they can get their hands on, and they use powerful hacking tools with little understanding of how they work or their consequences. These adversaries are immature, yet ambitious. They don't care about covering their tracks, just covering the most ground. The script kitty, which I, we tend to say those words, but I think there's a real element of truth to it. They can grab the latest hot pen testing framework or command and control server client pairing just off the shelf. They really don't know what they're doing. They just go download, they watch a YouTube video, uh, and then they basically reenact uh, what they do. They will spray and pray across the internet with a known vulnerability or some weak port or service that can be exploited. Uh, and they aren't aiming for a target, they're aiming for whatever it lands on. In any battlefield, knowing the enemy is essential, and cybersecurity is no exception. When you understand the motivations, techniques, and tools of today's hackers, only then can you anticipate where, when, and how they might attack. It's very important as a threat hunter to know the attacker life cycle so that you can start to conceptualize what the next steps might be. So if I see one event, how can I forecast what other events might have occurred or are likely to occur in the next hour, two hours, couple days of the intrusion? It helps when you know their tactics, techniques, and procedures, their TTPs, their style of hacking and doing a threat activity. Hackers may use various tactics, but at the end of the day, they're looking for the best way to succeed in their attacks. And sometimes, that means they turn to tried and true methods. You always see things like phishing. You always see 
that those types of things up front because that is exploiting a human vulnerability that you can't take out. Phishing and other kinds of social engineering have gotten much, much more sophisticated in the last few years. It used to be pretty easy to understand that the Nigerian prince was not in fact going to wire you back your money, but now we have a lot better even grammar in phishing emails, but certainly even more sophisticated phishing lures that are much more plausible. Those initial entry methods have become more sophisticated as attackers have learned what is getting caught. There's an endless game of cat and mouse being played between attackers and defenders. That means our adversary is always learning, experimenting, and evolving. As the availability of information has shifted from dark recesses of the internet where only a few people knew to the, the, the front page of YouTube, you know that the methods and the approaches to attacks have to evolve as well. One of the tactics we're seeing more and more of is defense evasion, where the adversary is trying to avoid being caught. Because the longer they can evade our defenses, the higher chance their attack will succeed. The way that hackers evade antivirus or other preventive measures is by crafting something new and not usually seen before. That can be random, that can be customized in one way or the other and obfuscated so that the computer, the automated program solution, might not be able to see it. It'll just breeze on by. When we're watching an intrusion, we do see attackers try to remove our software. Specifically, they might take our tool and try to uninstall it. They might specifically add things to their commands to let us know that they know that we know. And that's always a very interesting dynamic to see play out. Hackers are constantly changing no matter what happens because of defenders. So as we create whether it's detection rules, whether we get better at just observing it, whether we have um, analytics to be able to automatically see a bunch of things, hackers are going to change what they do constantly because they are a little more nimble in that way. They can change what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. I think that goes to show threat actors are with it. Threat actors know that, okay, the EDR or whatever buzzword you want to throw in there is only looking for this specific criteria. If I massage or tweak or change that one way or the other, I can fly right on by. Today's attackers aren't static. They have their own motivations. They're creative in their exploits. And they can adapt. That's because our enemy isn't a machine. Our enemy is human. I do think it matters a great deal to be thinking about the adversary as a human. Thinking about things like what kind of time would it realistically take, even with automation, to move from initial compromise to persistence, privilege escalation, lateral movement? Whether it's an automated piece of malware that's just kind of going on its own, it still took someone human hours to develop this tool. If, as a hunter, I see, you know, an open RDP port, I know that's a potential, you know, vulnerable place we can step into, but as an, you know, threat actor, they also know that's a pretty vulnerable place as well. The harsh reality is, today's attackers are tenacious. Sometimes they're better prepared than the people defending against them. And although they might be our enemy, in a way, we have to respect their persistence. I think that discipline of always learning new things is probably the most important virtue for lack of a better term, that we could take away from our adversary. The adversary says, I am going to take down this environment. I am going to ransomware, I'm going to get the money, I'm going to mine cryptocurrency, I'm going to enact the effects that I wanted. And there's a certain amount of undying, the de dedication in that. Uh, it's crazy, it's wild, but when you see it on the news, when you see, hey, ransomware gangs kind of beat their chest and say, we're going to work harder and faster and stronger, I think it, it has to be mirrored back to us as defenders when we're ready for the fight. We're, we're, we're jumping up to the call and we're saying, you know, we're not going to back down either. 